Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another edition of a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is our weekly podcast, and on the show, we talk about what's going on in the world of the Beatles news-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated radio program on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by the man who writes millions of articles on the Beatles millions every single... Millions and millions. Yes, his hands Carl, are sore. The Carl Sagan of, of Beatle journalism. <laughs> That's right. Steve Marinucci. How you doing, Ken? Hi, everybody. On today's show, we're going to do, it's almost like a continuation of our last show. We did a, a program on our wish list for Beatle fans for uh, 2013, what we'd like to see come out. This is something that I like to do at the end of every single year, and I thought we'd do a highlights of the past year of 2012. And Steve and I will both talk about our top five highlights of the year. And we want to specify that we're not saying whatever's number one is our favorite. We're just saying these are our five favorites because it's really tough. I know it's easy to overlook this past year and think, well, maybe not that much came out. But actually, there was quite a lot that did come out right. on the Beatles and uh, for the solo Careers really, and just... also and also some of the things that happened this year too are are quite interesting. So uh, just to uh, very quickly mention some of the releases of this past year, Ringo put out his album Ringo 2012 back in January, and he also did another All Star Band tour this year. Paul McCartney released Kisses on the Bottom. He followed that up with uh, a live performance at the Capitol Building which became a DVD called Live Kisses, as well as a collection of all the audio that's been released this past year connected with Kisses on the Bottom, which is called Complete Kisses. Gets a little confusing. Um, He also released the remastered Ram album, and George Harrison, uh, the Harrison Camp, released the DVD for the documentary of Living in the Material World, as well as the CD, a companion CD to go along with it, called Early Takes Volume 1. And then on the Beatles side of things, we had, and I might even forget them, I might even forget one of them, we had uh, Yellow Submarine and Magical Mystery Tour remastered on DVD, and we had the box set, the vinyl box set of the Beatles catalog. And you had Tomorrow Never Knows. Oh, that's right. We had a compilation, a digital compilation only, called Tomorrow Never Knows, of uh, 15 tracks of uh, great rockers from the Beatles. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Steve, why don't we uh, start with you, and you tell us what are your five favorite Beatle highlights of 2012, and most importantly, why? Okay. I'm going to say, first of all, that a couple of these are, are, are going to get a little personal. That's fine. But um, I'll start seeing, uh, finally getting Living on, in the Material World on DVD in, in the U.S. Um, I think that was... I mean, the documentary is just so good. I know it's been it's been flagged a lot on the internet because it's so long and because it didn't do it wasn't the the documentary everybody was expecting. But I think you know, having watched it recently again, it, it's so it's just fantastic. It's just gorgeous. Hmm. What, and, what do you mean by the way that the documentary that everybody was expecting? Well, I think everybody was expecting a more well-rounded documentary because there was a lot of stuff left out um, that that Martin Scorsese didn't cover. I think people were expecting a different type of documentary. They were looking at a more... More his music career? More his music, I think, and that's not what it was about. Mm -hmm. um, But uh, I think, I mean, I think it was a great documentary all around. And so my only criticism is why it had to wait six months and we all know why it had to wait six months it's because it was because of hbo which i think is absolutely absurd i don't think uh, there should have been any reason to wait here hmm. but at least it finally came out at least you know people got early takes although everybody that wanted early takes already had it by the time a lot or i should say a lot of people already had it because it was circulating here right after it came out in the uk true but um, I'm glad it finally came out, and the you know, the Zelex set is is gorgeous. And I, actually, I have seen the prices somewhat reduced on it now that time has passed. And you know, if you're going to get it, 
um, it's a it's a good thing to have. But that that would be one of the things. Now, when you're talking about the documentary, the CD you consider a separate release, or is it all one package to you? Probably it's all one package um, because it's it, they're so closely related. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I didn't in going in. I did not make it a separate favorite moment. But it's nice to have that, and as I said in the last show, I can't wait for volume two. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, another highlight would be seeing Ringo on tour again. I think anytime you see Ringo on tour, it's great. I don't, you know, his shows, are, you know, are what they are, and they're always fun, and they're, you know, what he does, and he he does what he does, and you know, it's not there's not a lot of surprises, but what usually happens with the all star band surprise surprisingly is that it's better than the sum of its parts, and that's what happened again this year. I, I think I like the last All-Star Band a little better than this one, but they're still good. And when I saw him, um, he actually, I don't know if he does this every show, but he actually did jumping jacks during the last number, which was just stunning to sit there and watch this, you know, Ringo as, a, as you know at his age doing jumping jacks. I mean, uh, he's been doing that for a long time. As he, well, yeah. it, it look it, <laughs> it's still great to see him do that, and uh, God bless him uh, for being able to do that. Um, so, just just one question here: You just talked about the band being greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. So, you're not that impressed with the musicians on their own individually? I don't think if you saw some of these guys on their own, you'd you'd be as happy with seeing them by themselves. I Todd think you'll Renfrew get a lot of Todd Rungan fans that'll disagree with no, you. No, I'm not talking that. about... Well, I'm not... I'm talking about the band, each member of the band, not just... I'm not trying to end, pick out certain people. Uh, Rungren was very special, although I really wish he'd had more to do in that show. Um, but it was great. It, it, Rungren was somebody I'd always wanted to see, and I was glad I finally got to see him. You know, um... But, uh, you know, there are some of the band that just, you know, you just kind of go, okay. But, like I said, the band is better together, you know, as a unit than they are separately. And, again, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm not pointing fingers at Todd Rundgren especially, because Rundgren is kinda, was a, a special choice. I did miss, I missed Edgar Winter. I have to, I have to be honest. Uh, we did Edgar have three was, tours in a row with him, though. Huh? <laughs> we had three tours in a row with him. True, and and I still miss Sheila E. I really wish Sheila E. would come back, and I hope she does at some point in the future. But um, okay, the band is good, and I am looking forward to the the DVD when it finally comes out. Okay, so you've mentioned two things so far. Okay, third would be the John Lennon letters. I think oh, that was an absolutely incredible book. Uh, it just knocked me over at the the look at John's personal life, um, and I think that's one book that you know if you're thinking about a book to get this year that you did not get for Christmas, that's something to get. I like so the book a lot too. I'm just it, surprised that it's it's in the top five for you, but yes, yeah, oh yeah, I, it's just a, an amazing. It's an amazing. I think it's an amazing book, and I think it's it, short of. And I wrote that when I, I when I wrote about the highlights on Examiner, I said short of getting a, uh, a new CD, this was a great release that told as much about John that any CD could. Uh, having Yellow Submarine back is another highlight for me. Um, it was out of print for way too long. I realized that they, you know, they were. Hoping to get the uh, the 3D version from Robert Zemeckis, and that didn't happen. And um, but I'm glad Yellow Sub Submarine is back in print. It should never have gone out of print. But that's what other... always happens with all of these right. movies. There's always a, a certain amount of time when it's out of print, and then the longer the wait, then the more of a demand there is, or more anticipation, the more of a buzz. Well, and that's... in Yellow Submarine's case, it was taken out of print. It didn't just drop out of print because it was taken out of print when they knew that when they first started thinking about the 3D version. That's what mm. I was told. And so they took it out of print. They they made it unavailable, and it just you know they they left it out of print for way too long, which was really kind of a shame. Now on the other hand, I have said before that I didn't think that magical. Although it's nice to have Magical Mystery Tour back, I don't think it accomplished what. What Yellow Submarine 
I don't think it was as important to bring back as Yellow Submarine was. So for that, right. uh, I know Paul, it was very obvious that Paul brought back Magical Mystery Tour um, to kind of get it, refo- refocus its its place in history and to have people reevaluate it, but I really don't think that the reissue accomplished that at all, or not as much as he hoped it would. But how do you even know that? I mean, that's something that happens over time. It doesn't happen instantly. Because Magical Mystery Tour isn't the film that Yell Submarine is. That's why. And, and I don't but think But there's, there's no way that you can just say that outright as if that's a fact and that's how it's always going to be. People's opinions change over time. And I'm not saying that Magical Mystery Tour is a masterpiece and it's going to be viewed as such, but maybe the public's opinion will change over time. There was a very interesting documentary that we're going to do a show on called Magical Mystery Tour Revisited, where you hear certain people like Martin Scorsese praise it for a number of reasons. So you don't know in the future how the public's going to view it. No, I don't, but I don't see, I can't really see a lot of people changing changing their minds on Magical Mystery Tour. It is what it is. That's my... And then the fifth thing is, is a little is a little more personal. It's probably the most personal thing of, of all, and that's the McCartney Walk of Fame ceremony in Los Angeles on February 9th, which was the same day that he did the, uh, the live Kisses on the Bottom thing in Capitol Records. And the reason I say that is because I was, in, I was there in the middle of it, and it was... A lot of fun. There, it was a lot of fun hearing the crowd scream, hearing, seeing Neil Young, seeing Diana Krall, seeing Elvis Costello, seeing James McCartney. But what was really Neil fun Young that, introduced him, which some huh? people some people might be surprised that Neil Young in- introduced him. Right. Yeah, that was kind of that was kind of interesting. And actually, one picture I saw on the internet misidentified Neil Young as Neil Diamond. <laughs> which, if you look at the two the two of them nowadays. There is kind of a, a little bit of a resemblance there, but which was kind of funny. But the, one of the reasons I'm mentioning this is because I was standing in front of the press section taking photos, and at one point there was a, a, a fan that had brought a uh, Honer bass guitar that he was waving mm. during the ceremony, and Paul saw the guitar, motioned to his assistant, they actually got the guitar, and he signed it, and Paul was standing directly in front of me when he signed it. I mean, like... Nice. So I'm sitting there, and, and um, Paul is signing this guitar, and he's, like, you know, <laughs> right there, and it's like, wow. <laughs> you know? mm. So that was kind of... That was, that was a highlight for me. I, ha- I have to... I mean, that was more of a personal thing than anything else, but also it was great that they finally got the fourth star, which is what that ceremony did. It it put all four Beatles stars in front of the Capitol Records Tower. Now, unfortunately, the Beatles star is not there. Uh, it's a little bit away, but it, it's relatively close by, from what I understand. It's not that far off. I've never been to the Beatles star. I've been by it. I haven't actually stood at it. But I have seen all four of the stars, the other stars, and that was, you know, very cool that that, that they're all there now. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Uh, and oh, I was going to say I have an honorable mention. The honorable mention, and I, I won't take up a lot of time, is the Joe Smith interviews of George Harrison, Paul McCartney, George Martin, and Yoko Ono. Boy, you're really raving about this. Yeah, I am because they're they're really historical. They're done. Um, they were done casually, and they were, and uh, the discussions were. These weren't press interviews. They were in each of the talks. They kind of let down their hair a little bit, and I finally dragged out my copy of the On the Record book and looked at it. And the interviews, not only those interviews, but some of the other interviews are just fantastic. And I really recommend that if you do not have Joe Smith's On the Record book, that you off the, I'm sorry, off the record, I'm looking at it now, um, that you get, um, you can pick it up pretty cheaply on Amazon, um, get a copy of it, it's well worth reading, and it's a great um, supplement to what's going to be coming out. Uh, Rolling Stone said the next batch is coming out in February, and it's going to be great to see what they what they pull out of there uh, in February. But these are just great historical interviews, and 
Uh, anybody that's a music fan, not only a Beatle fan, but a music fan, will want to read them. Yeah, when that book first came out, I bought it. And I was really impressed by it because apart from going immediately to the McCartney and Harrison interview and Yoko, um, I read everything. And there are a lot of artists in there that normally I may not have too much interest in. But you read these these interviews, and they are interesting. Right. Somehow this, maybe it's just Joe Smith and, and uh, his style of doing interviews, but you learn a lot about these artists that you never knew before. And And again, getting back to something I wrote the other day, the whole thing about Yoko, you know, and talking about Paul breaking up the Beatles, the, that remark is being taken way out of context. In in the context of what she's talking about, she's talking about a whole situation, a whole, you know, uh, historical thing. She's not leveling anything at Paul. And I think that's really kind of unfair the way that's evolved. I understand that's the way the Internet works nowadays, and people kind of pull things out like that. It's not but, just the internet; it's the media. It's always been well, like that. Well, it's the media, yeah. It's the media. It's the way the media works now. But really, that's not in this particular case what should be happening, um, because she says a lot in that in that interview. She talks about John's, you know, attitude and how John and they and both John and Paul. Or she says John says that they didn't want a reunion, and even Paul admits in his interview that. He knows that the ma- the Beatle magic worked with him and John, that it, and that they couldn't have gone, done it uh, again. So, hmm, is that the one? I'm trying to remember because somebody had asked him. I don't know if it was Joe Smith why he doesn't write with other people that much. And Paul had pretty much said that uh, you couldn't top writing with John. Yeah, he. Ba- that's kind. Of, I'm not sure if that's the question. But he, but that's basically the comment that yeah he couldn't top writing with John. Oh yeah, he he does say he talks about uh, well he actually you know if if people are looking for something to point at he actually points at Denny Lane and says you know my collaborations with Denny Lane aren't weren't as good you know I mean he, and he mentions Denny Lane by name right so uh, yeah I mean uh, but and and I don't see a lot of people jumping on you know jumping on that comment about Denny Lane. Mm-hmm. Um, they're jumping on the one about about uh, Paul and, and Yoko, and right. it's kind of weird. But it's a juicy bit. It's a juicy bit. That's it. That's it. And the that's what sells. Yoko, Yoko <laughs> Ono thing. Anytime you know, there's something about Yoko. There's uh, there's something to be said. Yeah. Okay. Incidentally, because we did a show on the David Frost interview, uh, where Paul talks about that Yoko didn't break up the Beatles, and that the Beatles were breaking up anyway, and um, Sean Lennon was actually interviewed. He was at Madison Square Garden at the twelve 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 concert, and they mm-hmm. brought that up to him, and he just said, "Yes, thank you, Paul, for saying that." He seemed relieved, you know, that finally Paul is saying this. So, right, and then and then now, uh, just a couple of weeks later, we have this turnaround, and and uh, you know, it's like wow. But anyway, that's the way it is. So, uh, my highlights, <laughs> my favorite highlights. Okay. Uh, would be, I'd have to pick the Ringo tour. I think all of Ringo's tours are wonderful. And it's really difficult for me to say what my favorite is. But um, the joy for me, as I've said before, and I think uh, one of the earliest shows we did was on Ringo and and this past tour, uh, is just seeing Ringo enjoy himself with whatever band he assembles. And he seems to enjoy being up front singing and also drumming behind these artists, probably drumming just as much as being up front and being the star. So I just like all the different bands that he's that he's accumulated over these years. They've all been a lot of fun. Sometimes they look very weird on paper, but then you put them all together and somehow they all gel. And this particular band, the mere fact that you had Greg Raleigh, who was a newcomer for the All-Stars, and you had Steve Lukather. These are two extraordinary musicians, and they added a lot to the band. A lot of jamming took place during this tour. That's true. Very. That's very true. That's something. That's uh, that was very true. Yes. Hmm. And bringing back Todd, who's a favorite of mine. You know, I thought it was a great band, and I look forward to each band as long as there's some change made in the personnel. You know, it's great to have certain certain artists who were there for three years, like Edgar Winter and Sheila E. There are certain ones who are like that. But after a while, you know, they're doing the same songs in each tour. 
Right. So it's nice to break it up and bring in some new people, as great as these other artists are. Okay. So I enjoyed this uh, this tour, and I'm sure that's the thing. I, I get frustrated with Ringo's tours because as a fan who's followed all of his music, I wish he would go deeper into his catalog. But then at the same time, Ringo's drumming behind songs that he's never drummed behind before with some of these artists. So that is a thrill for me. I still think Marvel back to the tour when he did uh when he had Gary Brooker. Uh-huh. And he was and that was fact, a few he tours. really marveled at that because I remember him the night I saw him introduce that saying, you know, he was so pleased to be able to have Gary Brooker on the tour and, and have him do Whiter Shade of Pale and it was just trem- it was tremendous to right. to hear that. So Uh huh. But with this particular tour, when have you ever seen Ringo drum on a Santana song? That's true. <laughs> You know, or a Toto song. That's true. So those are, 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 uh, those are highlights for me. Big okay. thrills for me. Um, also, I'd have to include the Magical Mystery Tour box set. And we did a show on this, but I love uh, all the work that was put into that. The vinyl EPs that were in there. There was a nice booklet that explains the whole history behind the film. I just think they did an extraordinary job. And all the bonus features on the DVD itself. I think so they you, gave you, you a lot you for the money. You feel better about the film than I than I do then, or the reissue than I do. Is that is that yeah, basically I do. it? I do. You know, it's been a long time since I watched the film until this came out, and I appreciate the film a little bit more. You know, I like to keep myself open minded to changing my opinions through the years. And um, something that I would find really interesting is talking to a young Beatle fan who doesn't have the whole history growing up with it knowing what it was like, knowing the bad uh, reaction that Magical Mystery Tour got when it first came out, and just exposing him to all the Beatle films and finding out what they like. Okay. You know, you, you may find some young fans who think that Magical Mystery Tour is exciting and A Hard Day's Night is corny, you know? And who's to say who's right and who's wrong? Well, that's true. That's true. Um, Except also, I don't know anybody that feels that way. <laughs> well, you're, you're also talking about people who grew up with them no, in true. our age bracket. That's true. You know, and but I love all five Beatle films for different reasons, okay. and I like the fact that they're all different from each other. The Ram box set I would put in there because I think that that was probably the best one of the bunch. I think uh, Paul put a lot more effort into this than in the other remasters, and I've loved the other ones. The only one that's been a real disappointment was the McCartney, the first album, McCartney. Really? Yeah, because to me, and this is the only criticism I'd make of the Ram box set, the deluxe one, is the most important thing to me is all the extra audio that you get, okay. whatever the bonus CD is going to have. And I still think that Paul holds back way too much. He only gave us, I think, eight tracks on the bonus CD for Ram, and some of them are songs that you already have, like Another Day. And I understand right. why it's on there, because it's from those sessions, just like A Woman, Oh Why. It's interesting to think of Little Woman Love now as being part of Ram, which mm-hmm. it really was. But um, I still think that Paul should have given us much more audio. And I think that I'd rather have a bonus CD with 80 minutes of music, even if it's alternate takes or remixes of songs, than to have Thrillington on CD, for example. Right. Or, or the mono RAM, which is still, you know, it's a, it's a part of history because it came out in mono. But, um, you know, still, the book that came out with it was wonderful. It's just the sound quality was phenomenal. And also, one of the things that I'm a big sucker for, which I think I said in another show, I like handwritten lyrics a lot. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things that came out this year, from any Beatle or solo Beatle release, there's an envelope that accompanied the deluxe box set of Ram, and it's got handwritten lyrics written on sheets of paper from Paul of certain songs from the Ram sessions. And whether it was done digitally, I don't know how it was done, but it looks like he just wrote this. It looks (laughs) that vivid. You know, that bright as you pick up the piece of paper, like he just wrote it in ink that's on this paper. And I love the fact that he gave us this. That's, that's really cool. You know, there's all sorts of detail given to the Ram album, if you read the booklet. I think a lot more time was put into the deluxe box set for Ram. I have to, I, I have to mention that when I saw Danny Sywell, um, he made a, a personal appearance locally here um, a couple months ago. He did pretty much it for any. Uh, he did basically what he does at, at uh, Beetlefest, where 
you know, he played along to um, McCartney songs. He also did other songs too, uh, probably a little more than uh, than he does at Beatles Fest. But he did he did that. Right. He mentioned specifically the Ram box set, and you could tell how proud he was. He was extremely proud of that. Yeah, and there are interviews in the booklet with Denny, uh, with um, David Spinoza. You know, different people who were involved in the making of of Ram. So, uh, yeah, I was very impressed with the Ram box set. You know, it gets a 10 altogether. I just wish that there was more audio. I still wish there would be more audio, especially when you consider the fact that I don't know how Paul's going to do this with Red Rose Speedway. There are a couple of songs from the Ram sessions that started during Ram, like Get on the Right Thing Mm -hmm. and Little Lamb Dragonfly. might have been interesting to hear those songs in their early stages during the Ram sessions. Right. I'm not quite sure if they were finished during Ram or they were just perfected during Red Rose Speedway, but we do know that they stem from the Ram sessions. So there's so much they could have done with the extra audio, and that's, you know, McCartney 2 is the one remaster where he gave you all that he could audio-wise. And I wish he would do, you know, more of that. I wish he had done more of it for Ram. But it's still one of the highlights top highlights of the year for me. I would also put in, and I group it all together, everything from Kisses on the Bottom. The CD, (laughs) Live Kisses, Complete Kisses, all the bonus tracks. I just love all the music that came out this year. And as, you know, we were talking about this with Live Kisses, I wish he had done this a long time ago, and I hope he does more of it. I'm not sure why I didn't mention that. I mean, I, I, you know, I still listen to the album. Um, I uh, had just I've taken the the CD, uh, CDs uh, from uh, Complete Kisses and you know burned copies, and uh, taken taken them with me in my car and, and listened to them a lot. And I'm, I'm I don't know I, I, for some reason I guess maybe because I mentioned the Walk of Fame thing that had you know that was related to that. Hmm. That's why I didn't mention Kisses on the Bottom? I'm, uh, you know, I I I do you know have to say that Kisses on the Bottom turned out better than I. Uh, initially thought it would so yeah for what, it, for what it's worth i just think that the songs are wonderful and the production the arrangements the musicianship everything put into it was just really you know it came up all aces for me mm-hmm. and i will add that the two original songs my valentine and only our hearts are definite highlights of the year for me and only our hearts i think is a gem that has been completely overlooked it has. and it's it's gorgeous it's one of those songs, and I said this on my show the other night, that I could hear Tony Bennett sing, or I could hear Frank Sinatra sing. It really fits their style. And, you know, it's not that easy to write a song today and try to write it in the style of standards of the past. Right. And uh, Paul was able to do that with those two songs. In some ways, I might even like Only Our Hearts more than My Valentine. Hmm. I hate to say that since that was the single, and that's the, the song that got all the attention, but Only Our Hearts is really wonderful. And I think Paul's voice... I love his natural voice, which you will hear on just a few songs on Kisses on the Bottom with that and My Valentine and um, what else? Um, Get Yourself Another Fool Mm -hmm. uh, on those songs. And I loved his voice on Only Our Hearts. I thought it was wonderful, as as well as Stevie Wonder's harmonica solo, which was great. Um, And then finally, and I probably would place this number one, would have to be, it's a combination of the DVD for Living in the Material World and the CD for Early Takes, Volume 1. And um, the documentary, while I will admit was not perfect, it was so great for many reasons. It really is more about George Harrison, the man, than just George Harrison, the musician. Right. And if you were really looking forward to more of a chronology of, Paul, of, um, of George's music career, then you would have been a bit disappointed because they really left out a huge chunk of his solo career right after the Dark Horse album and tour. Right. They really didn't pick up on George's music until the Traveling Wilburys, not even Cloud Nine. <laughs> they went into the, the Traveling Wilburys, and there was no mention of Jeff Lynne, who was so important you know, to uh, George's comeback. And uh, he's in the bonus track. There's an interview with him in the bonus track on the DVD, for living in the material world. But oddly enough, there's no interview with Jeff Lynne in the documentary. Same thing with Bob Dylan, which uh, we don't know the full reason why. Yeah, Bob, Bob Dylan, Dylan isn't in there at all, which is really kind of weird. That's a glaring omission right there. 
Mm-hmm. But uh, the documentary, I thought, was great because it showed all the different uh, sides of George, all the different interests in his life, uh, whether it was gardening or whether it was Monty Python or, or uh, speed car racing. You know, you got all that as well as the spiritual side and, and the music. Mm-hmm. So um, I think it was a very well-rounded documentary, but you do miss that part of his music career where they just really jump it's about 15 years there <laughs> right? in his music career. And they don't, you know, they spend all this time talking about the film Wonderwall. <laughs> and then there's nothing about Cloud Nine in there. And I, I know, found and that Cloud, really you know, strange, you know. Is a, it's really uh, such a fantastic album. I mean, it's just, it's so darn good. Yeah. Uh, you know. Mm. Yeah, it was such a commercial success. That was his big comeback right there. Right. And you'd think that they'd, they'd spend some time on that. It was very choppy in that regard, this this documentary. But still, you learn more, especially if you're just a newcomer trying to learn about George Harrison. You learn right. more about him, everything that made George Harrison the man that he was, than just the fact that he was a Beatle and he had a solo career. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate it for that reason. And then there's Early Takes Volume 1, which I really treasure now because I've just grown to love demos more and more. And um, especially where John, Paul, and George are concerned, sometimes there's nothing better than just one of them with an acoustic guitar. And, and George, uh, George's, uh, George's demos, uh, as anyone who has uh, heard some of the bootlegs, I mean, they're just fantastic. They yeah. They really, really are. And they're really kind of complete by themselves. Right. Um, there's something really natural about George and an acoustic guitar. And one of my favorite moments on early takes has got to has got to be uh, "Mama, You've Been on My Mind," the Bob Dylan song. Mm-hmm. I think that he is so right at home doing Bob Dylan music, whether it's "If Not for You" or "I Don't Want to Do It," which he did for the Porky's Revenge soundtrack, or he did a, a Dylan song called "Abandoned Love," which has never been released before. Um, and then you've got this. So, uh, and he was great at the Bob Dylan show, <laughs> the one at Madison Square Garden, the 30th anniversary. Right. Doing Absolutely Sweet Marie. He's so at home doing Dylan music. I wish that he had made a whole album of Bob Dylan music. But um, all the, the songs there, there's only 10 tracks, which is the only shortcoming of the, of the CD. But they're all really great. Right. Um, mainly stuff from the All Things Must Pass era. And it's so nice when you've heard a song with a band arrangement and it's stripped down to just George and an acoustic guitar or just bare bones with a band. And especially where All Things Must Pass is concerned, where you've had so many layers of production with Phil Spector, to hear it just stripped down to George and an acoustic guitar or just George with guitar, drums, piano, that's it. I I really wish that... that, um the Harrison estate would do what Yoko did and take a lot of the stuff that has, that is out there that has been out there, you know, in, on bootleg and, and just release the whole thing at one time instead of this, these little dribs and drabs, like early takes volume one, hmm. um, give us a, you know, uh, I mean, cause a lot of the stuff is out there, you know, everybody knows it's out there and let's, Quit fooling around. And, well, you know, where Yoko's concerned, the Lennon Anthology box set, which was tremendous to me, um, there's so much stuff still out there of John's that was aired on the Lost Lennon tapes that hasn't come out. And so aside from that four CD box set, you get the unreleased Lennon stuff in drips and drabs. Right. You know, you get bonus tracks on the, the remastered and remixed CDs that came out in the previous decade. Or you might have that one CD that came out in 2010 with the signature box set. But it's not like, you know, you get a 10 CD box set here. Well, of course, uh, you know, the uh, the bootleggers released the Lost London tapes, you know, as the show progressed. Right. And anybody that, you know, anybody that has that, you know, is probably, you know, doesn't really care. But um, it still would yeah, be nice. I mean, for you're, it, you're absolutely right. Yeah. That, you know, a lot of people don't have that stuff, and it'd be nice that you know if they had it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I do like the idea from a business point of view, putting it out a little bit at a time because it keeps the name out there, and there's always a new release, maybe every year, every couple of years, mm-hmm. as opposed to here's everything, dig in, enjoy yourselves, and then there's nothing left, or right. very little left. 
So, um, you know, I see that that point of view there, and I wouldn't mind if there was one CD of early takes every year. <laughs> I'd look forward to that. It'd be something to look forward to every single year mm-hmm. if it if it did come out that way. I would like to see more than one CD a year, um, and there's and we you know we know that there's very likely a lot of uh, you know enough for at least a couple, and it'd be nice if they did that. Oh, but, I, I would hope that there is material like this for just about every one of George's solo albums. Mm-hmm. I hope. We don't know. <laughs> no, we don't. Unfortunately, we can only we can only speculate. Although, I mean, there are you know there have been you know uh, various books that have information on unreleased stuff, but you know those books never get to the bo- get to the you know to everything because uh, nobody really knows. Nobody has access to everything. No. So before we close, I uh, just want to thank the folks at Fab4Radio.com for running our show every single week. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, we appreciate your support of the show, and uh, we encourage all of our listeners to write to us with any ideas for topics. And uh, the way to do that is by writing to our email address, which is, Steve? Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. That's right. Things we said today radio show at gmail.com you had to make it a real long name didn't you i know yeah i did and uh you can also get in touch with us on our facebook page for things we said today i have one under my name ken michaels steve has his under his name steve marinucci as well as your other facebook page yep oh god yes um but yeah i have facebook pages for all my columns and but i'm uh, I'm always on my. Uh, you can always find me on my personal page, and if you have comments, you can say them or whatever, and and I'm there. So. And also, if you'd like to find out more about my Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, you can go to my own website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com, and there's interviews on the website, on the home page, and there's trivia and contests every single week where you can win great prizes. Like the John Lennon letters, one of, uh, you know, Steve's favorite uh One of my favorite things highlights. That's right. Live Kisses, Beatles Scrabble Game, which we gave away. Stuff which like we that. we gave away. Yeah. So you can win that every single week. There's something interesting that I give away through my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. So thanks so much for listening. I'm Ken Michaels being joined by Steve Marinucci saying thanks again for listening. And we'll see you next time. See you next time.